Going from Wall Street to Main Street to help small business owners have the same capital as corporate America and give them the same resources as a larger company. We cover business funding, business credit, scaling, business consulting, and much more. Check out the website at shieldadvisorygroup.com. Welcome to the show. The Liquid Lunch Project. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Liquid Lunch Project. I am Matthew R. Meehan, alongside my partner, the professor, Luigi Rosa Bianca. What's on tap today, Lou? Today is all about refreshing truth. This one doesn't get an intro. He doesn't get any hype. Jonathan Hung, angel investor. Welcome to the Liquid Lunch Project, buddy. Thank you both. Happy to be here. So let's let's set the table for everyone. What yeah. is an angel investor? And let's do a deep dive. You know, for me, being an angel investor means that you have to be a gambler. You know, I'm a gambler. I actually go to casinos and I play high limit slots like a dummy. You know, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, you know, people are like you don't play card games. Like you went to MIT. You don't know about blackjack. It's like probably better odds. Like yeah, it's probably better odds. But it's just something turning $75 into 250 k I mean, I've done that twice. And I don't know what it is. Am I up? No, probably not. Am I up on my angel investments overall? Yeah, I would say that. But it's really what I love being, about being an angel investor is, is that it's your decision. You get to make the call. You find that person, whether he or she has a great idea or not. You know, you listen to them and see what you can do to help, right? And really, it's not about like having – a 50k check or 100k check that only gets you so far it's really finding someone that's like wow you're somebody who i love to work with and let me go find other people in my network to help you get to that next stage john you wake up in the morning you go to your office and your desk is filled with executive summaries deck sheets offers what makes a prospective investment stand out like what character traits do you look to in a founder or in a business that you just put that gold star on. Yeah. For me, it's all about the team. And really in the beginning, you don't have a world-class team of 25 different individuals like going to a same goal. You really have one or two or three founders really like, wow, you believe in their story that they gave up something. You know, I'm starting a new fund. It's called Grudge Ventures. And people will be like, oh, that sounds a little dark. That sounds like, you know, that like horror movie. And I'm like, yes and no, because like, I think really great founders have grudges to settle because It takes something where like, you know, I went to all these great universities, but it's like, you have to have something, a chip on your shoulder. You might have to be even a little petty to want to do this because you could work at Google. You could work at like Goldman Sachs. You could have a nice cushy job, you know, work nine to five and like be done. But when you're an entrepreneur, it's 24 seven. It's like, how am I going to get payroll? How am I going to figure out how to get the A to B, not A to Z? I mean, there's so many things that could blow up along the way that people don't talk about. We really like glorify, wow, when someone exits, but people don't talk about all the obstacles they had to go through to get there. So it really was hard earned. You may be touching on something, uh, a social character trait in America today, right? The the immigrant comes from overseas with a little bit of that edge, right? You know, from from perseverance and suffering, you, you want a better life, right? The guy that maybe was raised with a skinny belly wants to try to achieve that fat belly. But us Americans, we have what my grandfather used to call the fat belly complex. You know, you you don't have that hunger anymore. How do you, where's that hunger come from? You know what? It's not something that's taught. It's something that experienced, right? And like, I can't talk about everybody's background, but for me, you know, like I, I came from an immigrant family, right? I'm a second generation here in the U.S. Like I can't, I went to school and colleges here. Like my father lost his dad when he was 16 years old, lost his mom when he was three years old. I was fortunate to meet my mother um, in his 20s in Taiwan and moved here with $500 to his name and was able to become a multimillionaire out of true grit. Like he was smart, but it's like you have to get people to take chances. And really, it's surrounding yourself with great people. Like I always think it's funny when people give like, oh, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk all this credit. Do you imagine like it was just them? It was just Elon sleeping at the factory all night? No, come on. I'm sure somebody else was there too. And so that's what's so important to me. Like when I go to these communities, when I want to work with great people, I know it's not by myself. Like, you know, it's cliche to say it takes a village, but it certainly does. Any great entrepreneur will tell you that it wasn't what he or she did. It's that who he or she surrounded them with. 
John, so John, you have a pretty awesome portfolio of things that you've invested to, like Chow mm -hmm. Now, Gift, Docsend. I even seen yeah. that you were a partner that invested in Coinbase and Lime Scooters, right? Mm -hmm. Um, were these all angel investments or were they different rounds of financing that you got involved in? They were all different. Um, some were angel investments initially. Like I started a fund probably in 2018, not probably was it in 2018 called Unicorn Venture Partners with two friends. It I never re received outside capital, no LP money. So it was just our capital going into it. And you know, I tell people we look at deals that are pre-seed all the way to pre-IPO. So when you looked at Lime, it was a deal where it's like unfortunately we raised at a very high valuation. That was a time before, you know, the great it was the great recession it was really before COVID hit and it was like geez they were like trying to pr price a perfect to market like you know go get ipo money but it didn't work out obviously so they had to take a huge down round we got in at probably a two billion and it went down to 700 million in valuation because uber came in i'm glad you said that term down round everything in the economic climate that we're in right now mm -hmm. do you foresee some more down rounds coming in over the next 18 months or so Oh, absolutely. Because right now it's not in the hand of the entrepreneur that has power. It's the people who have the money and people are being really somewhat not, I wouldn't say frightened or scared. They're just holding back, waiting for really the best deals to come out. Because right now you're going to see like before, oh my gosh, everybody was getting funded a huge multiples, huge valuation and no revenue. Now it's like, well, I need to see revenue. I need to make sure that like this, you're going to survive because like I know companies, look, they've raised $10 million. They don't even have three million, you know, revenue as a direct consumer business. That's tough. You know, you have companies where, uh, you know, really unfortunately they raise at unicorn valuations in the secondary market. They're getting sold at eighty percent discount from their last round. And some can say like, oh, a fund is like trying to raise their DVPI and make sure they can return funds to investors. But like, that's not a good sign. If you think a company is worth eighty percent less than like five months ago. Like, does that make sense to everybody? It's tough. Like, and I can't name the name of the company, but it's just like, wow, it's so eye-opening because like people see like, well, there isn't that growth anymore. Like before, like, you know, everyone talks about Apple changing their private policy. It's true. Like you spend a lot more money acquiring customers than you used to. So we have to really look at people's business models again and see like, is this actually sustainable? So that euphoric period is that, that over exuberance period is it's gone, right? Where people were mm -hmm. just writing checks at the next valuation based upon whatever bank said that, that was worth and probably not really doing too much due diligence of their own, right? You no. know, there's a lot, a, a lot of our audience is always looking to raise capital. They're entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Some of them have too much shiny object syndrome and they can't focus. But for the ones that can focus, they really want to raise money for their businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of them are very good at what they do. They just don't understand the financing aspect of it overall, right? Mm -hmm. Can you break down the levels of funding from pre-seed to seed all the way up to pre-IPO? When I was on Wall Street, we used to get involved in pre-IPO companies because we wanted an exit, mm -hmm. right? We got paid on commissions. We wanted to exit fast. We don't want to wait for seven to ten years, right? So, yeah. Can you start with the pre-seed and how how the process generally works? Yeah, it's. I think it's the hardest. Like you know, I'm a founder too right now, and I'm raising money, and I know how hard it is because you got to get someone to believe in your idea and yourself. There's no finished product. You have no product market fit, and. Like I, I talked to people even yesterday. They're like, oh yeah, I want to raise 2 million on 10 million. Well, what do you have? Nothing. You don't have a prototype. So like, why don't you just raise a little less money? Like, I think it's like raise on, you know, half a million on 5 million, you know, give away 10% of your company, like see what you can actually do with 500,000 because you don't need 2 million necessarily in the really beginning. Please. I have, a, I have a question there, right? So I've seen a lot of these simple, simple agreements for future equity is that what yeah, most safes. everybody's raising money on safes these days and they're not using the convertible note anymore i think because of yc and all these accelerators like people are used to safes now because the funny thing about a safe is like i mean i have no obligation you know to somebody i could actually take the money go to tahiti and you still have no voting shares to say what like you know you could like sue me for fraud you could do that you could do whatever you want but like in the grand scheme of an investment vehicle yeah i have no I have nothing really that I need to do right away. A convertible note is different, but it depends if there's like a time frame to it, right? Like a convertible note could be two years. I was like, oh, okay, well, shoot, I've been in those situations where like, you know, I don't want equity. I like to get my money back, please, with the interest. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 
where, where me and Lou, when we, we invest in companies, it's usually on the debt side, right? Mm -hmm. um, but safes actually, you know, it, it makes it easier. good in a way because you don't have to value the company immediately, right? Because nobody really knows what the true value is. You don't. And it makes it just a little bit easier and faster, right? You, get, you deal less with the legal side of it, right? I mean, like, it's, that's the thing. Pricing around, there's so many things you have to consider, like pro rata, most favored nations, all these kind of like, you know, technical legal terms and investment terms that you need to iron out. And it takes time to close. A safe is like, okay, well, listen, I have a valuation cap. You know, I have a discount to the next round for you. Let Give me the time and go. And like, yeah, people have come accustomed to it. But I'll tell you this, most investors, if you're seasoned, if you know what you're doing, you want actual equity. You want a price round. You want a convertible note because that puts a little fire to the entrepreneur knowing like, hey, I am I have something on you. Like I've, I personally made mistakes. I mean, I've been a founder before. I gave this guy full control like a schmuck, you know, and I helped him raise, let's see, over $1.1 million. And he owned most of the company and they weren't they just weren't there was nothing in place where i could have called him out and like see what he's done and honestly what he's done is fraud it's like he's like done anything he wanted with the money like invest in stock market you know like he doesn't even give me like you know quarterly reports of how he's spending the money it's just so generic and it's just like you know we all make mistakes and hopefully you find really good decent people i think due diligence in the really beginning like we talked about pre-seed is finding somebody you can actually trust because you have to find a true partnership. Like it, 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 it just, it, it, it baffles me because like, you know, you see these, when you go to like the later rounds, like, you know, people just are, are more followers. Most, most VCs are sheeps. And it's like, it, it takes something to like, say like, I believe I'm planting a flag, you know, like I always make this joke that my dad said that, you know, it's like, you know, pioneers, who are going to be a pioneer? Like it, it's not always Christopher Columbus finding America, you know, sometimes people do die, you know, in the wilderness, you know, or like run out of water on ships coming here and there. So it's like, it's not always somebody is going to find success. You, I've had a lot more losses in terms of sheer number of companies, but in and over all the gains, like the true gains, like that outweighs everything. Like out of a portfolio for a VC fund, if you're investing out of 30 companies, there's no way you're going to be over 50% in terms of like wow you did an amazing job like think about the hall of fame for baseball like you're getting 300 percent three 300 you're good you know in vc i don't think most people hit 300 like i think you're hitting at the mendoza line at 200 20 percent then you're pretty good you're gonna be like top performing because yeah. when it's really early it's like it's really early ones will give you the most risk reward scenario that's why i said earlier about being a gambler it's something it's not like one to one like when you're investing at a series c like, yeah, you're maybe looking for a three to five X return at that point. You're not looking for 10 X. When I look at investments from where I'm investing, it has to be 10 X. If it's not 10 X, I can't even put in a dollar because I so, don't care about that little return. So Jonathan, what is, so we got the seed and the pre-seed, usually mm -hmm. friends and family rounds. What comes after that? So, you know, I would say seed is where you get institutional money. You get really good VC uh, backing. And from there, you have their Series A. So I think the Series A is really sometimes the most pivotal because that's where you're going to have to make sure that your initial investors in the seed round really believe in you, that they're going to do their pro rata or they're going to make sure like everybody knows that this is a great company. And then when you bring a Series A, like this is how I look at it. You're going to college. Like my job as an investor, pre-seed to Series A, is to make sure you raise your Series A. I'm your high school counselor. Like, I can't guarantee anything after you go to college, but at least you're in college, right? Like, you were actually able to graduate high school and move on to the next level. And, you know, as a high school counselor, I did everything I could. Now you're going to have to find your college professors to take you, you know, to make sure that you can graduate and then you can, you know, earn a living afterwards. And it's like a, just a higher form of help. So, you know, I think a lot of people think that they just need money and they don't need help. But I think the help and the relationships and what to do next is the biggest benefit over money nine out of 10 mm -hmm. times. Right. Oh, yeah. Not yeah. all money is good money. Nope. As nope. we say. You know? But yeah. But even more important to that is just the idea is like, you're going to waste money. Like, it's like you're not spending every dollar efficiently. There's just no way. Like, um, you know, I argue with this with one of my co-founders all the time. And he's like, you know what? It takes a million dollars to know if you have something in B2B software. Like, imagine that. Because it's like you could have the best program on the planet, you know, the programming that you've done with your CTOs and your engineers. But without a sales team to go sell it, to actually have somebody pay you a penny, you know, like 
It doesn't matter. It absolutely does not matter. So you have to get into the circles. Like I always think it's funny for my background before I was running contract manufacturing for my family business. And people talk about like, oh, I just fucking in front of the CEO. Like, no. Like when you're working with like Fortune 500 companies, you want to get in front of the CEO because he or she has no decision making when it comes to like your one product. Like if I'm selling something to Walmart, the CEO is not going to know who I am. It's that one buyer. She, he or she could be making like maybe $100,000 a year. But they have like this pencil or pen that can write million dollars of orders for you. That's who your audience is. Like, and you need an intro to that person. Like, like I remember, like, oh, like you know, like yeah, my 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 aunt introduced me to like uh, you know the CEO of HSBC. He wasn't gonna give me a job at HSBC. You know, you had to get to the hiring manager. You know, like that guy was like, oh yeah, I sent an email. That didn't mean anything. He sent an email. Sure, it's from the. CEO, but the person has so to John, when, you, when you're looking yeah. at a prospect, when you're looking at a file, how do you know this person is going to be a good steward of your money? Are there certain character traits you look to? Do, do you break bread with the guy? Do, do, do you take him out for a weekend? Yeah, that's that's key to me, but also just spending time. You know, it's weird now, like we're in this Zoom world. Like I'm not, I'm not in a studio with you guys doing this either, right? So it's like, really, the amount of time you spent. Like it, it's it's funny, like. I think communication is the key. Like how someone gives you details of information is really important. Like, I, but I've seen it both. I've seen it both ways. I've seen people like I've given money to where it's like, you didn't even have a pitch deck. You just gave me an email of all your bullet points. But like, how? Wow, you did an amazing job. Like those are actual bullet points that I could verify. It's like, wow. Okay. I mean, I know a guy with a dating app, you know, and I'm just like, he actually has people paying him. You know, he's cash flow positive and now he wants to raise more money. But I'm like, can you give me a deck? Like, how do you expect me to go? You want to go raise $10 million without a deck, without more information, without a data room? Like, like, like I said before, it's like, yeah, you could, you could get through a high school project, you know, with this, but you're going to get like a, a 4.0 in college with just like minimal work. So Jonathan, tell us about the company that you're raising money for right now that you just founded. Yeah. So it started in. It was actually, we had something else. It was called Team Kitchens before. It was the idea where, you know, during COVID, we were making Dodger dogs outside of Dodger Stadium and selling it to the fans. And it was a really great concept. It was so capital and labor intensive. You had to actually open up, like we went to ghost kitchens and opened up, you know, all these restaurants within other restaurants to deliver food. And then it dawned on us on this. It was like, that's hard. Like, you know, you still probably need $100,000 to open up a, a restaurant, like even with other people. So why not come up with something we had and it became kitchen data systems, kitchen data for short. The idea is a B2B software play where what we do is we help really celebrities, influencers, other restaurant brands get their food in other locations without building a brand new restaurant. Because what we do is we go to small, medium enterprises, other people's restaurants, mom and pops, and make food in their restaurant. Because what's so key about that is that you don't have to go through the, all the, you know, logistics of creating a brand new restaurant. Someone already, already has their A quality ranking. They already have staff. They already have like, you know, a food distributor. You go in there and say like, thinking about a factory, no one runs at 100% efficiency. Like even if you go to any diner or restaurant in the world, no one's like, oh my God, there's nonstop orders going through. There's time where especially if it's delivery first, you can make other people's food. And you're, and the biggest thing, like even factories owners have is like making sure there's enough production. So, and from that, like you already have fixed costs. They're done. Well, you're paying your employees what you're paying them every hour. So why not have them have more work to do? And so we have more orders. So then on the other side of that is like, okay, that's how we get celebrities or restaurant people who want to actually, you know, create a new brand new concept. Doesn't it that is, YouTube star, Mr. Beast do something like that? He does do something like that. He, he works with someone like virtual dining concepts, which right. is great. You know, he doesn't own like, you know, like it's like, imagine him opening all these McDonald's. It's impossible right for his burger so he uses like he actually does it off of, of trailers you know and actually yeah, out of buco de pepos is what i've been told to make really? his hammers yeah and so like I know, my, my kids made me order it for them one time like what is this <laughs> and and really the quality suffers sometimes because like you find out it's like wait this is being made at an ihop but why am i paying more well yeah. you're unfortunately paying more because he's mr beast you know and so like like you might order once but the question is can you keep ordering it Right, because there's a lot of data that goes into it. Because for restaurants, like they don't care if it's Mr. Beast or like you know, you know Brad Pitt or Ryan Reynolds or whoever, they care about like having orders fulfilled. Because the margins are really thin. You're not making that much money on food. Like you make five percent, that's great. That's an extra five percent. Um, what where we really help the restaurants is is in the cost savings. 
Like most people, most investors think it's like all oh, top line growth. It doesn't matter about top line. It's the bottom line. Like if I could pay less for my food costs, I make more money in the end. So really like our software helps mom and pop restaurants compete with the Olive Gardens of the world. The joke is people don't like grandma's lasagna. They like corporate lasagna because you have amazing grandma, Italian grandma making amazing food, but she can't price it the same as an Olive Garden. Why? Because of buying power. Olive Garden has a thousand stores in the U.S. started. They could buy a hundred, a million units of tomatoes. That one store can never buy that. So you can't have cost savings. It's just like me making shirts. Like if I make a thousand units of something, okay, I have to pay more because it takes more time to spin up the 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 yarn for this type of material. But if I'm buying like you know a hundred thousand units of something, oh, I get cost saving points all the time. Yeah, that's that's you're buying a hundred thousand units and you're distributing to them, and they have some mm-hmm. type of um, coalition or what is a, a con, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a lot of a lot of these restaurants, yeah, the economies of scale, right? But there's a certain word when it comes to me, I'll let you know. But that's amazing, man. Um, so have you guys implemented the software inside of some restaurants yeah. already? Yeah, we have, and that's what I go back to. Something funny, like even though we're a software company, at the end of the day, we're still sales, right? Because if those if we can't sign up restaurants, it doesn't matter, right? Because we have to tailor it to their specific needs and uses, like. It's different where it's like, hey, I'm Steve Jobs, and like, you need this iPhone. Like, I'm making you want this. But like, for restaurateurs, like, they're old, they're using, they're not probably even using Excel. They're probably like writing stuff on legal pads still, right? Ordering it, like, you know, putting it down. Like, there's no like true data when it comes to that. So, what's interesting for us is that we say, listen, we get you out of the bullshit of like worrying about like the tracking orders the numbers, everything. Like, we're your software company. Like, we're going to come here and help you see how you can be more efficient and really lower your costs tremendously so what would you say an exit strategy for you on this concept would be would it be to get acquired by one of these larger um food supplying companies distribution companies yeah like right now we're working with cisco we just signed a a deal with cisco and that is definitely an option right i tell people all the time i'd rather get you know, acquired than ipo ipo takes a much longer process because you have to generate enough revenue but a good rule of thumb is, especially for software sales and B2B, I would say is 10 million. If you have 10 million annual recurring revenue, you're going to have an exit. Someone's going to buy you. Someone's going to see that you have, you know, some sort of stickiness. And, and but, that, but from there, depending how much you grow, like you talked about Dotset, right? It was so interesting to learn about that investment because I got in like right before the Series B, you know, and they didn't raise after that, right? It was a bridge round to it. And what happened was they got bought by Dropbox, which is great. And like, I, it was like under a year, which is even greater for me. Cause like, Hey, like if I was an investor, I was like, Hey, the IRR or stuff. But what was so interesting to learn about that was like, if you had to understand where their sales were, you'd be shocked because you'd be like, wow, everybody uses DocSend in, in our world of investing, sending documents. That's great. You've heard of it. It's a brand name, but they weren't doing like hundreds of millions of sales. Their annual recurring revenue is probably around 13 million and real. And they probably had about, I don't know, 13 to 15,000 users. Like that's not that many, but the problem was, is that it wasn't enterprise, right? It wasn't a customer who had a corporate account and they had like, you know, 20,000 users under that. It was just like me and you literally sharing documents. And so that was great. You know, they had great engineers. The team was probably a team of 30 or so, and they were focused on even making file sharing so much easier. But if they were to grow that eight, that ARR, they would have to increase their average order value. Right. So it's like, how am, cause like, if I'm paying you, I don't know, let's say, uh, $20 a month for the software, right? For the privilege of using it. Well, I'm not going to pay you more money unless I get more out of it, right? So it's like, how could they have done more? They probably could have done, you know, signatures, e-signatures, or they could have like done like data room building, all that. But all of that would have taken them raising more money because they needed more engineers. They probably, for every like business, you probably need another 10 engineers to service it. So if they wanted to IPO, they probably had to keep growing and getting that annual recurring revenue up to like a hundred million. Not 100 million, probably 50 million would have been great for them to IPO. But it was so much better for the acquiring company, though, too, because they're not starting from scratch and figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Oh, absolutely. But like it's it's this thing where it's like build or acquire, right? Because like I always joke sometimes with like these, uh, you know, founders, I'm like, well, why should I give you two million? You know, you think about it because it's like, you know, I'm sure Facebook has two million dollars lying around. Microsoft, Amazon. I'm sure it's like a rounding error at best for them. Like, why can't they do it? Like, 
you know, and you talk about Clayton Christensen's like book, Innovator's Dilemma, like sometimes the big people don't focus on this minor little part of the business, but then that part grows to something huge. You know, you see that with Salesforce, for example, like nobody was paying attention, you know, and then, wow, here comes Mark Benioff focused on that sector, you know, because he was at Oracle before. Right. And look, this is what the CRM has become. That's what people care about. And so for from my perspective, it really is, hey, if a company isn't focused on this and now they can just buy you and add you in, it's really great for a B2B sales perspective, like technology perspective. But then I think about like consumer. I've made a lot of consumer investments, too. And it's, it's a totally different field. Right. You get like a 15 X multiple on revenue for 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 software. But for consumer, it's like you're maybe looking at, you know, anywhere from three to eight X and it's all about sales. You know, it's all about having that brand loyalty, like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, aren't going to look at you if you're not doing a hundred million in sales. Like they don't care because they need that volume going back to like economies of scale where it's like, okay, we bring, we bring you in, we can lower your costs immediately from the bottling factories that we have, you know, and then, and our distribution is even better. It's like, we just add a, you know, like a case of you to the rest of the Cokes, you know, in the trucks. We could put you everywhere. And so that, we can, it can also move the needle for a company that's that large too, right? That's why they need that much more top line revenue. Sometimes, yeah. Because like when you think about top line revenue, like I think Fortune 500 companies, if you if you've increased sales by 10%, like you're you just won, you got your 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 bonus, you made it, you know. But a 10% for a startup going from year to year, no one's gonna invest in, it, right? Like in consumer space, like you know, you have to go from year one to year two, you have to double or triple your sales. And that's like on a relative scale, like you're going from half a million to one and a half million, but that's showing the trajectory that you're going to hockey stick, really. So you need, like I said, we need 10x returns from a from an angel, from VC perspective, because that's how you're going to be able to exit. Because like you're not working in the billions of revenue, where like so 10% is going to make a difference. Speaking of exits, mm-hmm. what was your best exit? What was the unicorn? My back. So on paper or on actual real life? Actual those real, real dollars. Right? I don't want the paper stuff. Right? Right? <laughs> you, that's really, that's you, up with you, right? Like they always joke about that. So, okay. The best exit I've had so far is a company called Bear Flag Robotics. And okay. so this is a friend from business school, Gino Cafiero. Great guy. You know, I just, I wrote the first check for him. You know, and it wasn't that much. It was twenty five thousand. But you know, he and I always joke with him, like, man, you like you you had like a three and a half million dollar valuation cap, and like a month later you went to YC, and YC like at that time took like one point seven million, <laughs> you know, as a valuation. So, like you you <laughs> cut my money in half. Thanks. But you know what? That was great. That was great. He went there because he got all these other great VCs to put, see him and put in money and for him time to pivot. So, you know, that twenty five thousand in under four years. You know, and I put in another 25, like probably around his series A. So for a 50K investment with under a four year duration, I returned over seven figures. That's awesome. So he he exited the company for 250 million to John Deere in 2021. And it was just like, wow, amazing. It's, it was basically Bear Flag Robotics was making tractors autonomous. Because like, hey, I, you know, Elon's trying to do it, but no one's driving out there, like not touching the wheel, you know, like, you know, the whole time you're driving. But it's much easier to deal with LIDAR in an open field, you know, where there's maybe like a bunny, you know, versus actual children and like cars and everything else coming at you. Crosswalk. <laughs> yeah, right. Like no red lights, you know, <laughs> on, a, on an agricultural field. <laughs> you know, somewhere in the mid 2000s, a lot of companies decided it was better for them to probably probably 2010 to probably now. They decided it was better for them to stay private longer, mm-hmm. right? Because they kept getting the valuations. Do you see that landscape changing at all? Or do you think companies are still going to stay private longer rather than IPOing? I think it just depends on where the source of capital comes from, right? If that, That's the thing. You IPO because that's where money is, right? You need money to run your business no matter what. It's not about just like, oh, I'm going to exit and sell all my shares and, you know, move. I've like a year before moved to Florida, so I don't have to pay that extra 30% if I'm in New York <laughs> or California, right? It's, it's really about running your business. You know, that's the most important thing. And sometimes right now, like we've seen it also, like with even family offices that I'm a part of at Truesdale Ventures or, you know, other big global private, like, like SoftBank, for example. Really, it's just that if it is more efficient for you to get our money and then grow the business and we could see a higher exit 
down the road, then we'll do it. It makes sense. Because listen, when you IPO, there's a lot more things you have to deal with. You have to go, you have to go, not just like you're, because like you think about this in Elon Musk's perspective, he doesn't want SpaceX to go public. He can go, go IPO SpaceX at any time, but he doesn't want to do it because he, he wants to control the company. And so you hear people buying secondaries of SpaceX shares or SPVs, and that's why he controls it. Like literally if you, you're an employee and you want to sell, like you have to get Elon's approval. Like that's how like he holds it so close. Cause like once you're over 99 investment investors or investment uh, entities, then you have to go public. You know, you have to get that, like, is there's those SEC rules in place, but most of the time it's like you do it because I can grow value faster without going through the scrutiny of being a publicly traded entity. Yeah. So when, when, when I was on wall street, we did a lot of those um, SPVs. I actually, I spearheaded one for Facebook before it went public. Um, but we had the lockup period. We were buying a lot of shares from the employees. Mm -hmm. This way they can cash out too, because yeah. the longer that you stay, the longer you stay private, the employees that came on for stock options oh, too, yeah. they yeah. want to start living their life. They're not 25 yeah. anymore. Now they're 35 and they have a family. There's a little bit of yeah. a difference right there. So I think that whole secondary market really came about during that time frame too, right? For employees yeah. to get rid of their mm -hmm. shares, which is amazing. Um, so you're doing so much right now. You're launching another fund. You're part of a bunch of family offices, right? Mm -hmm. What's next for you, John? I mean, I know you're going diving deep into this new new company as well, but yeah. what, what else um, is next? You know, if I had to say from a personal perspective, I'm engaged, so I have to get married. You know, that's the key. That's a brand new journey. Like, Mazel tov. No, thank you. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm excited about that. She's an amazing woman, Caroline. Um, but, you know, starting a family, I think, is important, too. You know, passing it down to the next generation is important. Like, I think of my life built up into like whether you like basketball or not. Like, I like think of it in quarters, right? You know, the first quarter you're zero from twenty. You're like you don't know anything. You're just a kid, right? Twenty one to forty, like you might have kids, you might get married, you might figure out what your career is. I think from forty one to sixty, like I'm turning forty this year, so I still got another year to get to forty one to sixty, right? It's like that's where you're gonna know what you're good at. And what you did, you have all this great experience, you know? So as I get to the third quarter of my life, that's it. And the funny part is like, once you get to that fourth quarter, hopefully it's like, you know, 60 to whatever, a way past a hundred. It's like, you're probably gonna make more money after you're 60 than you did in, from 41 to 60. You wanna run up the score at that point. Yeah, yeah, because it's like, you actually know, it's not like Peyton Manning, you know, like, oh, you gotta retire. Like, like Tom Brady at one point is gonna have to retire, you know, in his forties, you know? You can't go to 50 something. But I bet you, like, all these guys are going to make even more money now in their third, fourth quarters and their third quarters because you just got that experience as an investor. John, I'm afraid to ask this question because I know you're going to get a lot of inbox messages from this show. Yeah. But where can the audience find you, get in touch with you, or learn more about you? Uh, for me, honestly, I think one of the best tools is uh, LinkedIn. You know, I do a lot of posting on there and like, you know, reach out there. That's important. I have my website, of course, jonathanhung.com. There's an email there. You could send in, you know, like your pitches or just like general things. But I think LinkedIn is the best way because you know why? You find people who you're connected with. And so it's like, oh, you see that person like, hey, maybe they can do a, a warm intro so much better. Like, but I, you know, I've seen people who are just like real jerks. So I'm like, listen, if you can't like find somebody to intro you, don't bother like texting or like try to reach out. Like, I think that's so stupid. <laughs> it's just like, you have no idea. None of us know who the best company is going to be tomorrow. I think, listen, if you have that drive and passion and you have a grudge or grit or something more than just like a curious like you know wonder about your company you 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 have to be relentless so come find me you know if you really believe in what you're doing send me your deck send me everything that you think makes sense show us and listen like i have a lot of blogs you know i, I write about stuff that helps you uh, as an entrepreneur how to raise money what you need to focus on what i as a vc wants to look at you know it's yes of course i said it's the team but after that there's all these little metrics that we have to make sure you're tracking or you know aware of when you go raise more future money because here's the thing i never tell somebody no i just pass because it's not there yet. you know like i always joke with people like hey if i pass and you don't come back to me then okay well like yeah that that's your fault because it's like you didn't come back to me i probably would have made the investment if you told me more but some people get offended it's like oh he said no i'm never going back to him. i'm gonna screw up and that's okay that's great too you know, there's that, there's that grudge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm going to prove him wrong. What the hell does he know? So it's like, that's great. You know, and then maybe I'll buy you when you're public, you know, and still make money off of you when you, you know, when you're public.
John, if you could pick one sector right now that's mm-hmm. going to get really interesting, right, over the next two years, mm-hmm. what sector would that be to look in as an angel investor? And it, not technology, but a little bit more deeper, maybe a subsector. Yeah, I think, you know, we hear the catchword all the time in a, a Web3, right? And what does that mean to everybody? I don't think it's about, you know, having a picture of a board ape, <laughs> you know, or having like a doodle or, you know, some colorful like panda bear, you know, it's really about like this era of how Google and Meta or Facebook or whatever, or even Amazon having your data, um, it's not going to be the same anymore. It's like you as a brand... We're, you're going to have to find a way to engage your customer better, right? It's not just me like putting up a Facebook ad and like expecting sales to go up from there, you know, or like, you know, like back in the day, like, Hey, we put an ad in the newspaper, right? That Who does that anymore? Right. It's going to be like, how can I attract my customers and for them to willingly give me what their preferences are. Right. I think that's the key. So whether you're a B2B company or a direct consumer company or, you know, a CPG company, we're going to see that. Like, look, Starbucks always trying to innovate. Right. They're working on their rewards program now where it, when it comes to Web3. So it's like, hey, I'm going to be able to like you download the app. I know this is the type of drink. You're more of a tea drinker than you are a coffee drinker. And so, like, I'm going to push these products to you better. And then you could tell me yes or no. Um, you look at like McDonald's. Now. I don't know if you guys have been doing McDonald's recently, but like, I, listen, I'm not like, oh, all caviar. You know, I like hot dogs too, right? So it's like, I mean, but you go to a McDonald's, they're like, oh, are you going to order with your app? Like, what does that mean? That's just them collecting more data on you right it's like they, they that free french fry is gonna like go a long way from them understanding what i need to order for this guy before he even like shows up john also you by you in california though that kid was wor- working the front counters making a hundred thousand a year so they need that kiosk well the funny you bring that up it's just like uh yeah absolutely like you know going from 20 like what 15 dollars an hour to like 20 25 but you know what i have a company that's going to hopefully uh help that out you know miso robotics is the idea of like it's not a replacement it's an assistant right so it's like you can hire maybe less people to help you get you know work at the fast food counter <laughs> what, what does miso robotics do so the audience? Miso- Miso Robotics from where it was to what it is now, light years, totally different. Like when burger I said, flippers. Yeah. When it was a burger flipping robot, that's how they got pitched to me years ago. And it was something where it's just like there was no prototype. It was like four PhD students from uh, Caltech, you know, wanting to build a robot. And I was like, let me take a chance. Like, I don't know. I was probably crazy back then. And I was like, okay, let's do it. You know, and I gave them 25K. And, you know, from that, like they went into – geez, beverages and like making chips now for Chipotle or making like a great uh, tech called CookRite. Like people think about it, the robots, but there's also software in this play where CookRite, it's like it monitors the heat of a steak or a burger. So you know exactly if it's medium or medium rare. And so like even a trained, like, you know, anybody, you don't have to be trained. That's the best part. It's like, you just see like, oh, look, it's that color. I got to flip it over now. Like that's pretty easy, right? So that's some great tech right there. I think like, Right now, their their revenue is going to grow tremendously next year because yeah, there's a shortage of workers. Inflation is up. John, we want to be respectful for your time. We really appreciate you being on. I learned a lot. I know the audience did. I think your your email box or your in, LinkedIn DMs are going to start blowing up, right? Oh, okay. But before I do let you run, mm-hmm. right? Tell me one thing you look for in a founder. The one thing. Yeah. Um, Can't be grudge. No, no, no. That's <laughs> part of it now. That's part of it. Because like you really want somebody who has that. But like uh, after meeting so many people, I think the most important is uh, willingness to look and ask for help. Because a lot of people think they know what they're doing. And that's great. It's a lot of confidence. Like you want that, of course. But there are times when you just have to pivot. Like if you can't be egotistical about it. It's like, no, this is the only way to do it. And you have to hire like appropriately because it's like it takes one team to go from zero to a hundred thousand in revenue it takes a total different team to go from a hundred thousand to a million so sometimes yes it is mark zuckerberg like founding the company and still being the ceo to this day but sometimes you have to be willing to listen and say okay i need to step back maybe i have to bring in um you know someone like eric schmidt at google you know to take over you know uh, to get us to a different level or that you know what marx did was great i had to bring in cheryl sandberg you know to be my coo to help me build the company out so it really is about 
a willingness to know that like, it's not always you and it's really who you hire, who you surround yourself and willing to listen to investors. Cause like, listen, I, I've, I've seen it. And this is the funniest thing you bring it up. It's like, I've given a guy a check, you know, like 25,000 every time you raise money, you know, I sent him that link and said, congratulations. And I never heard back from him. Could you imagine? Like in the beginning, he was asking me for money and like, oh yeah, this, that. And then I never heard back from him again. And then finally this last time when he raised like 70 million and I said, I was like, hey, I got to keep your tradition going. Like you might not respond back, but like, I, I feel it's bad luck if I don't keep responding to you every time you raise money. So it's like, and he finally responded. I don't respond like, wow. to that one. <laughs> yeah. Like, listen, he didn't have to listen to me. He didn't do anything, but listen. It, it, what if he did? What maybe he'd been, he'd been a little bit faster, hopefully. You know, he could have got that, but that's okay. You know, it's like sometimes it's really just uh, how you interact with others is, is so important. Jonathan, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you guys. That's a wrap of another episode of the Liquid Launch Project. Thank you for listening to the show and make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you on the next episode of the Liquid Launch Project.